This video is sponsored by Audible, and this is by far the most consumed plant oil in the world. Or at least this is that oil in something closer to its original traditional form. The version used today in processed foods, soaps, cosmetics, biofuels, all kinds of things might look more like this or maybe like this. It can be refined into innumerable forms, but all of them are fats derived from the fruit of the oil palm. This is by far the number one edible grease in the whole wide world. This and derivatives of this are in probably dozens of products in your home right now, quite possibly on or in your body. Is that a bad thing? Probably, yeah, I think so. Probably a bad thing, at least from an environmental standpoint, though I'm not at all convinced that the alternatives would be much better, unless you think that stop guzzling so much grease is an alternative. Probably should be. If you're wondering how palm oil ended up in everything and endangered the world, you're in luck because that's the subtitle of the new book Planet Palm by longtime food and environmental journalist Jocelyn Zuckerman. The so the meat of the fruit is um, gets crushed, and that's where you get the palm oil. And then inside there's a kernel, and you can also crush that, and you get palm kernel oil. Um, so you get two different kinds of oil from the fruit. Um, and the, the oil from the kernel is mostly, mostly used in cosmetics. So this is the former. This is oil made from the fruit part of the fruit. It was made in Ghana. The oil palm is native to West Africa, where this has been like the cooking oil for thousands of years. In its relatively unrefined form like this, it tastes real strong. I don't know how to describe it. It's got this sort of bitter thing going on, this very vegetal thing, kind of has the aroma of my spice drawer. The first thing you probably noticed was the color, right? That color is from carotenoids, the same things that make carrots and tomatoes and salmon orange but the stuff that's used in processed foods has been treated in all these different ways so as to make it basically tasteless, odorless, uh, colorless. The other thing you probably noticed about this is that it is thick. Palm oil is 50% saturated fat, so it's semi-solid at room temperature. The oil made from the kernel or seed of the fruit is even more saturated. This is like 80% saturated. This is palm kernel oil. Because they're so saturated, these fats behave more like animal fats, which are generally pretty saturated, right? As a result, they are solid at room temperature or semi-solid at room temperature, and they are less quick to go bad, less quick to oxidize, go rancid. Where I live in the American South, the really abundant oil a century or two ago was cottonseed oil, a byproduct of the cotton textile industry. That oil is mostly unsaturated, so it went bad real fast, and it's liquid, so you can't make soap or biscuits with it. The industrial who built this house in Macon, Georgia, was among the geniuses who figured out that you could add hydrogen atoms to unsaturated fats, and you can make them more viscous and more shelf-stable. Hence, crystallized cottonseed oil, Crisco. I have a whole vid about that linked in the description. Now, if instead you get your oil from a palm tree, it's already saturated. There's no need for fancy modern industrial processing. Already saturated. This is a very rare property for a plant oil to have. The oil you get from the giant seed or kernel of the coconut tree is like 90% saturated. What we think of as a coconut, the brown and white thing, that is the coconut's kernel. 90% saturated that fat is. But the coconut palm tree does not yield as much oil as the oil palm tree does. The oil palm's productivity is insane. In Africa, they're very tall and thin and, and people had to climb up them and it was uh, often falls would be fatal. The way they're bred now, um, particularly in Southeast Asia, they don't grow as tall and the trunks are much thicker. Um, so, but the original ones look just like a coconut palm. What I found so interesting when I was researching this book was that basically the infrastructure for the slave trade, when the slave trade was outlawed, um, the, the British traders started sourcing palm oil um, and used that same infrastructure. It was particularly in the um, Niger, Niger Delta, sort of swamp area and then rivers that go up into the interior where the, the oil palm trees grew naturally. Um, so the canoes that they used to use to, to shuttle human beings for the slave trade, they then started shuttling palm oil. Um, and it was used during the second industrial revolution for soaps in particular, um, People were starting to work in factories and going home really dirty, and so soap became a much bigger thing. 
also for use in um, lighting lamps and eventually in uh, margarines. Ah, uh, margarine. Oil-based butter replacements. Is there anything more emblematic of what food writer Michael Pollan calls the American paradox? His books, like The Omnivore's Dilemma, are available now on Audible, the sponsor of this video. Let's thank them and hear what Pollan means by that. By speaking of something called the French paradox. For how could a people who eat such demonstrably toxic substances as foie gras and triple cream cheese actually be slimmer and healthier than we are? Yet I wonder if it doesn't make more sense to speak in terms of an American paradox. That is, a notably unhealthy people obsessed by the idea of eating healthily. If you think you don't have time to read books like these, consider Audible. Listen while you do the dishes or something. If you get an Audible membership, you'll get one credit a month for a title in the premium selection. That's new releases and such. You download the title and you own it forever. In addition to that one download a month, you get full access to the Audible Plus catalog, which is basically everything else. Thousands of audiobooks, original audio entertainment, guided fitness and meditation, ad-free versions of your favorite podcast, all ways to get some joy and enlightenment in your ears when you think you don't have the time. You can try Audible free for 30 days. Do you and me both a favor. Go to audible.com slash Adam Ragusea or text Adam Ragusea to 500-500. Get that 30-day Audible trial with my link in the description. Audible.com slash Adam Ragusea. Thank you, Audible. Now, we were talking about the dubious advent of margarine. Vegetable oil-based butter replacements could be made made with naturally saturated palm oil. They could also be made with unsaturated oils that have been partially hydrogenated. The problem with that, of course, is that it results in trans fats, which medical science now regards as basically the worst kind of fat that you can eat. Indeed, Crisco now is no longer made with trans fats, or if there is trans fat in here, it's a very, very small amount. What's in here instead? Well, a few things, but one of them is palm oil. The big push to eliminate trans fats from processed foods is certainly part of palm oil's meteoric rise, but it's not even close to being the whole story. In her new book here, Jocelyn Zuckerman shows how palm oil is popular because, yes, it is naturally well-suited to many commercial applications and because it is extremely cheap. Part of the reason this is so cheap is because of how productive the oil palm is. The yield that you get per acre of cultivated land is insane. It's miles ahead of any other oil crop. But there's another reason this is cheap. Stolen land, slave labor, <laughs> big part of it. The story of the modern palm oil industry begins with the introduction of that African tree into Southeast Asia. Most of today's palm oil comes from Malaysia and Indonesia. Basically, it grows best um, 10 degrees to the north and south of the equator. So it's basically that tropical belt um, around the world. These are basically the same places where rubber trees grow, and European colonial rubber plantations started to shift to oil palm when synthetic rubber started to eat into their business. But then after independence, these governments had lots of um, poor people, and um, so gave them parcels of land and oil palm seedlings and encouraged them to grow oil palm as, as I said, a poverty alleviation scheme. And then once the industry learned how to fractionate and process it into all these different uses, then it was, they were able to just sell it more around the world. The resulting deforestation of vital tropical rainforest has been huge in its contribution to global warming and in its devastation of habitat. You probably already heard about the whole orangutan thing. Orangutans are the closest living relative to humanity. If you ever looked at one in the eye, it is straight up like looking at a person. Orangutans are losing their homes to oil palms, though they are hardly the only important species to be affected. How about humans? So in Malaysia and Indonesia, um, in particular Malaysia uh, has a smaller population and higher um, standard of living. So a lot of Malaysians aren't particularly interested in in these like menial jobs on the oil palm plantations. So they, re they um, rely on a lot of imported labor, um, often from Bangladesh, from Myanmar, um, Rohingya. And a lot of these folks are brought in under false pretenses. Um, they, they, recruiters come to their villages 
and say, we can get you jobs in restaurants or in, in other hotels. Um, they put them on a boat and then they traffic them in um, and then they land on these plantations. Often they confiscate their passports um, and they have to pay, basically pay off these wages that they've paid to the recruiters um, in advance, thinking that they're going to get good jobs. And then they're stranded on these plantations. And some of them have had to literally you know, make escapes um, under cover of night. Now, the United States and other countries have banned imports from or otherwise sanctioned certain palm oil producers over these abuses. But Zuckerman's reporting shows how it can be really hard to trace the origin of oil once it gets all blended together in the international commodities market and refining process. So that's what she means by slave labor. What does she mean by stolen land? Well, by way of example, she travels in her book here to Liberia, where the government there is getting its oil palm palm industry going by renting jungle to big companies. That land is inhabited, but not by people living a modern, developed economy type lifestyle. People like that are hard to displace without significant compensation. But people living an older or traditional lifestyle are often less able to assert their rights. The people were, who had lived on that land, they got tiny payments, and but they now had no place to farm or to live, and they said that their, their rivers were poisoned because of the, um, the agrochemicals. Um, but the, the government, you know, wanted to use this as a, as a poverty alleviation scheme. And so the governments tend to be on the side of the companies that are giving them. There's also often lots of corruption involved. So the companies are, are paying government officials um, who maybe don't care so much about the people who are actually living in these villages or in these forests that are then raised in her book, Zuckerman also travels to Central America. Workers there on oil palm plantations are fighting to unionize to improve their horrific working conditions. They get snake bites, they have falls, stuff falls on them. They get covered in agrochemicals, all while making pitiful wages. I interviewed one man who had who tried to come to the States on, on one of the um, caravans. And he said, you know, I've worked for this company for 10 years and it's just nothing, you, you just can't support. He had three kids. He said, there's no way to support a family, even though I'm working. He was working six days a week, basically around the clock. Now, labor abuses are in agriculture all over the world, but the concentration of the palm oil industry in these equatorial nations with their particular economic and political problems and histories probably makes this particular crop more of a center of badness. So, what are you, as a conscientious consumer, to do? Well, of course, you can try to buy less palm oil. About two-thirds of it gets consumed in foods. The most conspicuous place you'll generally see it is in prepackaged baked goods where they need a shelf-stable, solid fat. But of course, any other vegetable oil is going to have its own problems. They all take far more land to produce oil. That's one of the reasons why palm oil is popular. It doesn't take much land. And honestly, looking at labels will only get you so far, especially considering that palm oil is fractionated and added to a million products under a million different names. Even if you somehow get all palm oil out of your diet, it's still probably in your bathroom. It's in your toothpaste and your makeup and your shampoo and your moisturizer. You could look for products with an RSPO label. It's conferred by the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. Um, when I was in Honduras, I talked to folks on these plantations and they said the RSPO investigators had just been there and they said, one, we were coached before they came. We were given a script. This is what we're supposed to say about how great our working conditions are. And, um, and then after, they, after the inspectors left, they said that those who didn't follow the script were punished or fired. Um, those who did were given a, a banquet with soda and food. In her book, Zuckerman goes to Ecuador and visits smallholder farms that work with natural habitats. It's a company that tries to buy and sell palm oil the right way. She was super impressed. You could look for that, but it's a tiny sliver of the market. In general, I think this is one of those problems that people like me can't just consume our way out of. People like me in the United States, most of us probably just need to consume less period. Though what country consumes the most palm oil? It's India. As a, as a cooking oil and then also in, in, process, in all those chips and snacks that they make. But um, the, as you may know, there's so many street vendors in India. And um, when I was over there, it seemed that they were all using palm oil because it was cheaper than the other oils that they could get. And it was interesting because they denied it. First they said, no, we're not using palm oil. And then I could see the wrapper underneath the um, 
and same with the shopkeepers. I, w I was with um, a woman from the Public Health Foundation of India, and we went into some shops and asked for cheap oil, and they gave us mustard oil and soy oil, I believe. And then we said, don't you have anything cheaper? At first they said no, and then he said, okay, well, here's the palm oil. So there's like there's the stigma about it because they sort of know that it's not healthy and because it's not grown domestically, um, but they're all using it because it's cheaper. I think it's dumb when we focus our consumption guilt on one product or one ingredient or one company. That's the kind of thinking that leads us to loudly decline something on moral grounds while quietly accepting something just as bad over here, except now with some smug moral superiority mixed in. What you do with this information is up to you, but this is what palm oil is, this is how it ended up in like everything, and this is why some very smart people are very worried about that.